Here we're going to talk about the background and history of coordination chemistry, at least the very basics. Um, this will deal with structures and isomers. So the term coordination compound comes from a coordinate covalent bond where both the electrons from the bond come from one atom. So this is slightly different than a traditional covalent bond that you're probably more familiar with, where you get one electron from uh, both atoms that are contributing and sharing those electrons. Here we're getting them from one, uh, just one of the atoms. Um, they're Lewis acid uh, base adducts. So the metal is going to be the Lewis acid and it'll be bonded to a molecule atom or an ion, and that is the Lewis base. These Lewis bases we call ligands. And you can have a coordination compound that is charged, just like you can have a molecule or a polyatomic ion, and there are some similarities and differences in the way in which we treat these. Uh, it's kind of the same thing with coordination compounds. You can have a coordination compound that is neutrally charged, or you can have one that has either positive or negative charges associated with them. And those in particular, we call complex ions. Um, so the number of donor atoms bonded to a particular metal center is called the coordinate number um, or coordination number. Um, so you have a metal plus the bonded lig ligands, and that is the coordination sphere. Um, sometimes called the inner coordination sphere, um, but just coordination sphere is fine. Um, oftentimes, the coordination sphere is simplified to uh, only the metal plus the bonded donor atoms. Um, this is that local symmetry. Sometimes those ligands are quite large, so they're not totally represented. So you just draw in the bonded donor atom or there'll be some shorthand for how those ligands are connected to each other and some things like that. Um, so we can kind of zoom in on just the metal plus those local bonded uh, donor atoms. And that's just the local symmetry of the metal. And the, some of these symmetries are going to be um, things that you've heard in the past, um, like, like octahedral geometries and things like that. Um, so when we write out um, a coordination sphere, that is enclosed in brackets. So here you can see there are brackets. Um, everything that's within that bracket is what is coordinated to that chromium. Um, so that would be what we call the coordination sphere or inner coordination sphere. And you can see it also has a counter ion on the outside of the brackets and there's that chloride on the outside of the brackets. Um, so there's uh, chloride inside the brackets and outside the brackets. And we actually need to treat those quite differently. One is coordinated to uh, actually coordinated to the chromium. The other one is a counter ion. So um, what it means is that you could remove that outermost uh, chlorine and we know chloride is negative one charge. So it means that if we were to do that, um, that uh, would actually be a complex ion, that chromium based complex ion, and it would have a plus one charge associated with it. Um, so these, um, we have kind of different ways of distinguishing between an inner sphere coordination complex and um, um, and what's outside of those brackets. So this is the common way in which we, which we write these. Um, we've known about these for a very, very long time. So Prussian blue is a very um, famous example. It's this really uh, brilliant blue and it's been used for a very, very long time as a dye. Um, you can see that that is actually a coordination compound. Um, we actually didn't have theory for it, however, that can actually give us an understanding of how you got these particular colors or the chemistries of these compounds. We just kind of knew that they were um, things that you could either make or uh, minerals that could be found essentially um, that, that could um, uh, have these particular colors or features. So our modern understanding of what actually happened started with uh, Alfred Werner at the turn of the 20th century. So he used some tests. Um, one of those was conductance. The other one was precipitation tests um, on these compounds. And they were actually uh, matched very well with Werner's uh, approach or hypothesis to, to what these uh, coordination compounds actually looked like. Um, he mostly used cobalt-3 and chromium-3 complexes. That's partly because they were relatively stable. So 
well, what we would say is that they're kinetically non-labile ligands. So the ligands would exchange very slowly. So it means it was pretty, uh, pretty stable. So you could kind of observe what's occurring. If the ligands exchange too fast, a lot of these conductance or precipitation experiments would be challenging. It means that stuff would be able to switch between inner sphere and outer sphere coordination. Um, so you wouldn't kind of be able to study that uh, inert uh, coordination compound or complex ion. So here's an example of what, what we mean by like a precipitation experiment to try and see. Take a look at this uh, cobalt uh, complex. You have these chlorides that are outer, outer sphere coordinated there. Um, so they are um, not, a, not actually coordinated directly to the cobalt. So it, if you were to add silver nitrate to a solution that contained that first compound, um, you would have a precipitation occur of silver chloride, which is insoluble in water. Um, but if those chlorides were intersphere coordinated and you were to add silver nitrate, you would not observe a precipitation occur. So this was kind of a way of distinguishing between chlorides that were intersphere coordinated, or, or I should say a part of that coordination compound, um, or just a counter ion. Um, so this is what we mean by a precipitation reaction. And conductance can do something fairly similar. How many ions in solution, essentially, is what, uh, is what that can get at. Um, so you need, of course, your theory and how this works to match up well with these experiments that could get precipitation products or um, conductance, meaning how many ions were in solution. Um, and the, the competing theory at the time did not do this very well. So here's some examples of uh, Werner's formula, which is the modern formula. That's what we've been showing you um, using the brackets, for example. And here you can see there's a series of cobalt complexes where you have varying numbers of chlorides that are either part of the coordination complex, meaning inside the brackets, or a counter ion, meaning outside of the brackets. And Werner's formula and model predicted the number of ions um, correctly. And um, the, the, the competing theory at the time was this chain formula where you had various length ch chains coming off of something like cobalt. Um, so if you had cobalt that uh, was a plus three charge, uh, the idea being you could kind of only have three coordination sites to that cobalt. So how could you stay within that uh, rationale while well, you're getting many, many things bonding, quote unquote, bonding to it? So the idea being, well, maybe there were chains that were dangling off of that cobalt, um, uh, where Werner's formula is distinguishing between what's that coordination sphere or inner sphere coordination and what is outer sphere or not a part of that coordination comp complex. Um, and you can see in each of those uh, inner sphere coordinations for Werner's formula, each time there are six, um, uh, six atoms there that are uh, bonded to the cobalt, um, which means that there's a coordination number of six, which is um, like your prior knowledge, coordination number of six most commonly would be an octahedral configuration. So that these are all octahedral complexes. Um, and you can see with that chain formula that that's nowhere near what we now know to be octahedral coordination uh, complexes. Um, also, another complicating feature um, is some stereochemistry that can be found in some of these complexes. And Werner's approach was also able to explain that stereochemistry. So here, if you take a look at this, where we have three, or sorry, we have four different uh, ammonia groups, which confusingly we call amines, um, and two chlorines. Um, you can see that there, there's a couple different uh, um, stereo, two different kind of uh, stereochemical arrangements that we could have here. You could have what, what we would call trans, where the two chlorides are trans to each other, uh, or cis. And they actually have different physical properties. So one, one of them is green and one of them is violet. Um, and Werner's approach, showing this as an octahedral compound, an octahedral complex ion, um, can distinguish between these two. Uh, even though both of them would have other similar properties in terms of conductance experiments and uh, precipitation experiments, depending on what the counter ion is here. So you can see that these are complex ions because they do have a positive one charge. 
So outside the bracket, you could have another chloride, for example, a Cl minus. Um, that would be, again, called outer sphere coordination or counter ion. Um, either way, there is not a chemical bond between that cobalt and uh, whatever it is that is outside of the, of the brackets. So this is just representing what's inside the brackets.